statement that you made about my having entered academia, you know, I, after my retirement from the Indian Foreign Service and I get an opportunity to travel around in the country and outside, so I tell most of my audiences that if I had not gone into diplomacy, I would definitely have entered the field of academics and teaching because I really like it. I enjoy it to have a conversation, a dialogue, establish a rapport with the people and uh, learn from what they are thinking and what uh, they, their aspirations and ambitions are. Wonderful. Eh? You see, it's a boon for the academia and uh, I hope that uh, all of us will be benefited by your uh, experience, your writings, your uh, discussions. And you know, it's a different world. Here we agree to disagree. Mm. You see, <laughs> that is the best part of it. And if someone is having some creativity, one can come with new ideas. And especially in law, uh, I always say that there are three types of definitions in law. Uh, it may be lexical definition, it may be stipulative definition, it may be a theoretical definition. And when you are working in the field, then uh, mainly it is the lexical definition which the people understand. Hmm. Uh, the meaning of law, which is understood by a particular language community, and from there, the you see, the things starts. And uh, it becomes the duty, it becomes the, I think, uh, everybody responsibility who are in the field of law uh, to find out the gaps between the law in books and law in action. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, uh, you see, uh, persons like you, who are having the uh, field experience, because basically, your academicians are theoreticians. We live in our own world. Now the things are, we are um, uh, shifting towards the socio uh, legal researches and you see more and more we want to have, go for the empirical studies. Previously it was mainly doctrinal. And uh, this understanding that the law is a social institution. The moment we uh, go uh, by it, it provides a a greater opportunity, larger understanding regarding the nature, purpose, and function of law. And I know that uh, the, the topic which you have selected for today's discussion, uh, you will be discussing it in your own way. <laughs> and uh, then we will uh, discuss that according to our, uh, you see, uh, so many dimensions are there, social, economical, political, and legal too. Hmm, indeed, indeed. And uh, that is the beauty. And I hope that uh, Isha and her uh, center, uh, which we are planning uh, at the university, um, they will do some good work. No, I'm and, sure there is, uh, you know, so much of hard work has put it, been put into this. Yeah. But, you know, just two or three comments on this, your very valuable uh, uh, suggestions that you've made. You know, <coughs> one is uh, that... Uh, uh, you know, when I appeared for my own uh, foreign service IS exam, and that was way, way back in uh, late uh, 70s. So at that time, we used to, we had to choose three topics at undergraduate level and two <coughs> subjects at postgraduate level. You might be aware because now the whole curriculum and the syllabus for entry into the UPSC exams, that has all changed now. So at that time, I had chosen two law subjects at the higher level, which is at the post. Law one, law two. <laughs> I had chosen jurisprudence because My jurisprudence, God. I found it to be so conceptual that you don't really have to learn anything very much, but you can develop and evolve it from uh, basic principles, ab initio, you know, in, to, in terms of what are the principles and philosophy on which a society is based, on which nations are created, etc., etc. Second thing, as you said, I think uh, whether it is academia or it is practitioners and policy makers and decision makers, they unfortunately operate in silos. 
they are in their own uh, sort of you know tall ivory towers there is not very much of interaction i think we need much more interaction much more understanding so that theory and practice can come together and we can really find out as to what is possible so uh, i find you know my interactions and i travel around the country quite extensively so it uh, it is a very good experience to hear what our young people are thinking what their understanding is and if we can give some suggestions or ideas to them as to how to move forward so i very much uh, welcome this opportunity also thank you thank you very much uh, but i, I will um, just uh, tell one thing you know i always envy uh, is officers and the ifs officers you last why mm -hmm. because i also took the attempt when oh, I I, yeah when i did my uh, when i was doing my llm i appeared for upsc and the pcs Others. Which year was this? Uh, it was in nineteen seventy six and nineteen seventy seven. Oh, I see. Okay, so a couple of years before me, actually. Yeah, as uh, right. I'm older than you. <laughs> <laughs> I, But, think, uh, I think I think it, it, it may be age wise because I started my teaching uh, in nineteen seventy eight itself. Okay. After okay. that, I was selected in PCS, in the provincial services. but you see i took two attempts you see there were three papers in ias and two papers for ips okay and, okay <laughs> and uh, i think the same format might be there when you might have appeared yes yes absolutely three ah. papers at the lower undergrad yeah. level two yeah. at the yeah yeah yes. so 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 uh, they were not making the distinctions like uh, undergraduate or, or postgraduate level the, these were the papers it was uh, for is there were three papers and for mm. ips there were two papers and gk english etc yeah, yeah yeah essay writing and so, so 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 but you know i was called for interview twice mm -hmm. but i couldn't get seat even in class 2 services to my surprise other than that i have never failed anywhere in my life i was selected in PC. my friends five of uh, we were having a group of five persons out of them one is the advocate uh, he became politician and uh, i am in the academics and uh, three are in the civil services and uh, now they have retired and um, uh, now i am asking them to just join academics but uh, they are taking their time one is uh, one is settled at mumbai and other is in lucknow so that's like but uh, as i told you that i envy um, uh, ias because i always say that the best people are selected but mm. i don't know what happens during in between uh, mm. they fail to deliver uh, what they were expected to mm. the potential of an officer is not uh, i think uh, uh, given opportunity to do what it should be done no absolutely i think the environment has a huge role to play and i think what you said uh, it was uh, you know loss for government and governance and uh, the, uh, the no 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 i am very happy because it was a gain <laughs> for the legal uh, profession the day one and you will be happy to know that i am having many students who have been selected in yes indeed yes. indeed in upsc pcs pcsj now they are some of them are high court judges in uh, mm. lucknow high court and so so i am quite happy and i know i believe in uh, destiny i believe in karma hmm. and uh, i try to read uh, you see geeta and so i know that uh, my destiny was decided by uh, almighty and uh, he was knowing what i have to do here and believe me i think uh, my profession is the best profession on earth i i feel always young because i am working with the young Yes, every, time, every year yes and yes. you see my uh, my team uh, she will um, introduce you one boy yadav like uh, what's the name I isha ganeshwar shaileshwar shaileshwar yadav and his team um, they are doing so well and 
when you are working with them, you are trying to shape them, and uh, you enjoy making of a lawyer or making of a professional um, in between, then it gives you immense pleasure. Indeed, indeed. And uh, that is not possible for the executive. I always say that in our country, executive is very strong, but we are having the different type of uh, executive officers. Some are elected, some are nominated, and some are selected. Hmm. Sir, President, Governor, they are nominated. They are also the executive officers. And uh, Chief Minister, Cabinet Ministers, they are elected persons. But IAS, uh, Chief Secretary, uh, other secretaries, they are the selected persons. They have been selected by some combination. And you see, the combination of all these three, <laughs> it depends upon the um, wisdom of the elected leader what recipe he will make out of it. No, absolutely. And I think all of them have their own very unique individual role to play. Exactly. exactly. So as you said, if you are happy with what you are doing, right. that is the elixir, that is the panacea. Meaning if uh, you are happy in your own skin, I remember there used to be a very nice uh, saying, which said the bloom where you are planted, you know, irrespective of where you are, give your best to wherever you are, whatever you are doing. And I think you you will feel happy and the whole environment will uh, also. Right, sir. I think uh, Isha, she, she is looking at me. And, uh, <laughs> no, <sir. laughs> once the lockdown will be over, we'll be happy to have you with us on the campus. And um, it will be a very good day for us when you will be with, her, uh, with us physically. Thank you very so, much. Thank you. Yes, Isha, you, can, you may carry on. Yes, thank you so much, sir. Though we have already had a wonderful start of this session, but still we have to fulfill some formalities. Uh, before I start with anything, I have a very humble request to all the participants to kindly keep themselves in mute mode. Second thing, if you have joined this meeting with a different name, so kindly rename yourself and join this meeting with your actual and original name. I request uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to kindly grant me the permission to start this webinar now. Please go ahead. With pleasure. Thank you so much, sir. On behalf of Dharma Shastra National Law University, Jabalpur, I, Dr. Isha Vadva, Assistant Professor of Economics, extend my heartfelt welcome to our Honorable Guest Speaker of the day, Honorable Ashok Sajjanhar, sir, former Ambassador of India to Kazakhstan, Sweden and Latvia, and former Secretary, National Foundation for Communal Harmony, Government of India. We also have the esteemed presence of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir, Professor Balraj Johan, Sir, who will chair today's session. Sir, I welcome you on behalf of all the faculty members and students who have joined today's session. Thank you. I also extend my heartfelt welcome to all the academicians and students of different colleges and universities who have joined us today in our national webinar on post-COVID world order. The world is witnessing unprecedented times due to the coronavirus pandemic. Not even the best of minds are aware of the treatment or the prevention in terms of the vaccine or medicine. These extraordinary happenings will definitely impact the world order. The legal combinations of an international world and the deadly virus without the cure is taking humanity into uncharted waters. COVID-19, in all likelihood, will fundamentally transform the world as we know it. Everyone is curious to know about the global world order post-COVID-19. Therefore, to throw some light on the issue and to provide an insight to this, we have with us today such guest of eminence. Dear participants, it is truly my honor to introduce the guest of honor and speaker of today's national webinar. 
we are indeed privileged to have noted diplomat honorable ashok sajjanhar sir sir has worked for the indian foreign services for over 3 decades he was the ambassador of india to kazakhstan sweden and latvia and has worked in diplomatic positions in washington dc brussels moscow geneva tehran dhaka and bangkok sir negotiated for india in the uruguay round of multilateral trade negotiations for india europe india asean and the india thailand free trade agreement sir has worked as the head of national foundation for communal harmony he is currently the president of institute of global studies in new delhi sir writes and speaks on issues relating to international relations and indian foreign policy we have seen sajjan har sir many a times in recent past on the rajya sabha tv the big picture on ndtv and on india tv as panelist in discussions fortunately today we all got an opportunity to directly get benefited from his words of wisdom sir I thank you for accepting our humble invitation to speak in today's session on post covid world order and now i humbly request our honorable vice chancellor sir to kindly speak a few words uh thank you isha uh, on behalf of uh, dnlu fraternity and on my own behalf i extend a very warm welcome to his excellency ashok sajjanhar sir I welcome faculty members, students, and all participants who have joined this webinar. And I am hopeful that uh, the words of wisdom, which uh, our uh, keynote speaker is going to shower on all of us, will provide a direction. However, as I was discussing with you, Isha. post covid world order uh is good and it uh, gives hope also that this uh, covid crisis will be over we will get rid from this pandemic and uh, we are thinking one step more but i know uh, uh our uh, present day speaker is an academic academic giant and i have listened him on different channels so he might be focusing more on the present day situation with covid the order which is emerging because what will be the post covid order it will depend what it is and what it, it is going to be in next 2 3 4 5 6 months and you know uh, it is because of this pandemic people were locked inside their houses it is because of this pandemic we were forced to keep our persons inside their homes and anybody who came out they landed in jail you know more than uh, 7 lakhs people uh, jailed only because of uh, breaking the order because initially we thought that uh, if uh, there will be complete complete lockdown then we will be able to break the chain of corona the focus was how to break the chain of corona but literally slowly and slowly we realized ki initially our pm said jaan hai to jahan hai and for jaan the only thing which was thought important that was to keep people inside but afterwards because lockdown 1 lockdown 2 during lockdown 3 it was realized nahi 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 nah, nah. pm said jaan bhi aur jahan bhi life is important but the livelihood is also important if we have to survive then marx and others you see uh, we have to find out the ways to earn we have to find out the ways how to provide support to the livelihood and that created another dimensions in our struggle against the pandemic and you know uh, i was just reading uh, uh, 
uh, his excellencies i say uh, achievements and the positions and i found that he is also the uh, president of the national harmony foundation and sir what a wonderful thing it is because i believe because the, the name of my university is dharm shastra nishan my university and when the foundation stone of this university was laid down by the then chief of india in presence of the uh, chief minister of the madhya pradesh shri shivraj singh ji uh, cabinet minister shri ravi ravi shankar prasad ji chief justice of the madhya pradesh high court shri hemant uh, honorable justice hemant gupta ji chief justice of the patna high court honorable justice rajiv menon ji and uh, judge of the madhya pradesh high court justice honorable justice r s jha sa presently who is the chief justice of the punjab and haryana high court uh, the name which was given to it it was only because because uh, it was an experiment new experiment in the field of the legal education my student um, know it very well that uh, they thought that by opening this university they will be able to provide values because when we always say that we believe in constitution but how they will know uh, that how they can show that they believe in constitution because when you read the preamble and the words which are coming there assuring uh, promoting among them all fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and the integrity of the country securing justice it's okay but along with justice the most important thing is promoting fraternity and you see kamnal uh, you were leading the foundation for the harmony and i think uh, and you are the uh, right person fit person and i always tell my student dharam shas instants for the promotion of values values of the constitution that that is our dharam shas it has nothing to do with any other thing dharam means they must know what are the fundamental duties and how they can promote propagate the values and sir believe me within these two years and the students which i got i can say that uh, this is my third university national law university as a vice chancellor uh, but uh, the quality of a student i uh, old students i appreciate them they are doing very well in their life but uh, the way these students are working i think uh, they are the best and uh, i am hopeful that your words of wisdom will provoke them will force them and provide them guidance to work with more commitment and vigor so i will say sir it is a wonderful day for us to have you with us and i won't take much time because we want to hear you as much as we can so you are welcome and i uh, now over to isha thank you so much sir and now i humbly request sajan ha sir to kindly take over the session very well thank you very much isha thank you for this very generous introduction and thank you honorable uh, vice chancellor professor balraj chauhan ji for your uh, wonderful words i think both of you whatever you have said you have uh, truly laid a very appropriate ground foundation for whatever i am going to say you have mentioned about uh, what the uh, world is going to look like post covid we do not know when that uh, situation might arise you have mentioned about the promotion of values which we need to do and you have uh, rightly commended your students i'm sure when you commend your students you also mean uh, your uh, teachers who are your faculty who are working exactly. under your inspirational and visionary leadership to uh, provide uh, the right sort of values as far as the student community is concerned so let me start on this uh, what i have been told by isha that i would speak for about uh, 30 minutes or so no sir time, time is no limit oh well that's very kind of you that's for you for you will uh, please 
That's very kind of you. But uh, uh, you know what I want also to do is that after my initial remarks, uh, since it will be 30, 35, 40 minutes, I will highlight some of the ma major issues, flag some of the major issues, and then leave some time for the question answers and comments from the floor, because I think that is most exciting. You are uh, a professor who has taught in so many universities, Isha and all the others who are also in this uh, webinar are also in this field. And I know that the best learning is done when there is an interaction, when there is a conversation. So I would like to off uh, COVID-19, coronavirus is concerned. Isha, you have mentioned very rightly that this is an unprecedented challenge, unforeseen, unanticipated. I think one could use so many adjectives to describe it. But I think if you were to look into you know, some of these specifics, we would see that uh, although the world has been dealing with crises and with pandemics, not for 10 years, 20 years, but several decades, but I don't think we have ever had to face a pandemic of this nature. Why? Because more than 200 countries and territories of this world are impacted by it. There is no other pandemic which has really led to this. And as you said yourself also, there is no cure. There is no vaccine. We do not know when one is going to be uh, available. Although, as it has been said by very many people, that the best minds, the best talent, the best geniuses and the highest funding is going into this endeavor to create a vaccine. So hopefully maybe by the end of the year or beginning of next year, we are going to see some sort of a vaccine or some sort of a cure as far as coronavirus is concerned. But I think this, uh, and as uh, uh, the honorable vice chancellor mentioned, you know, this uh, pandemic has exhibited itself, has impacted all of us in multiple ways. One, of course, we have spoken about the health and the challenge that it presents to the global community as far as health is concerned. Now, I have the figures here in front of me. It started over last two months, of course, in China. People say it came in in uh, November of 2019. They, of course, came out to the world in January of uh, this year and so on and so forth. But still, as far as these few months are concerned, we have 5.3 million. We have 10 million people who have been affected by this, who have been, uh, 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 who have, uh, con have confirmation positive, who have tested positive as far as this is concerned. There are about 500,000 about half a million who have died. This is being really compared to the Spanish flu, which took place about, uh, about 100 years ago in 1918. So this is the severity of this uh, pandemic in terms of health. The Honorable Vice Chancellor also mentioned about the impact on the economy. All the economies have uh, been impacted and have suffered greatly as a result of this. You know, just the figures that came out by the IMF day before yesterday, I would like to share that with you. And as far as India is concerned, I would also like to share very briefly the figures that they had given, the IMF had given in the report that had come out in April of this year. So as far as uh, the world is concerned, the uh, growth, G GDP growth, uh, and since you teach economics, Isha, so, you know, this would be something very close to your... Uh, mind and uh, 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 appreciation. In 2019, the GDP growth for the whole world was 2.9%. During this year, it is going to be minus 4.9%. As far as the US is concerned, which is the biggest economy of in the world, last year, the GDP growth was 2.3%. This year, it is expected to be minus 8%. If you look at the Euro area, uh, the uh, Eurozone countries, about 17, 18 of them, uh, their uh, growth 2019 was 1.3%. This year, minus 10.2%. Now, two countries, which, you know, one India and one China, which we are uh, particularly uh, want to know about. In China, 
Last year, the growth was 6.2% GDP growth. This year, it is expected to be 1%. In India, last year, again, our economy had started slowing down. As uh, you and all the participants are aware, it was 4.2%. But this year, it is expected to be minus 4.5%. So as the Honorable Vice Chancellor said, we had to go through the lockdown because as the Prime Minister, as the Prime Minister said, we have to save the knowledge. If we have to save the knowledge, we have to have to lockdown. The lockdown was one, two, and then the third one. So now, if our growth in the last year was 4.2, then this year was minus 4.5%. इसको मैं आपसे कहूंगा अगर आप कंपेयर करें जो अप्रैल के महीने में जो आईएमएफ ने फिगर्स दी थी उसमें उन्होंने कहा था जो चीन का रेट ऑफ ग्रोथ जीडीपी ग्रोथ इन दिस ईयर इज गोइंग टू बी 1.2 परसेंट और भारत का जो रेट ऑफ ग्रोथ उन्होंने प्रोजेक्ट किया था दैट वाज 1.9 परसेंट सो वी सी एस टू हाउ globally and also regionally how it is coronavirus is impact, impacting the economy of the world and individual countries. The third aspect on which uh, there is huge uh, impact is on humanitarian and on social level. You know, in terms of the displacement of people, the report that came out day before yesterday, it said one person in 100, uh, 100 individuals is displaced from where they were living because so much of joblessness has taken place. We have seen in our country that where they are, when they are closed, 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 so all of them are going back to their homes and going back to their homes. So we have seen that it is not only in India, but it is in the whole world. So that's why there is displacement, there is a joblessness, there is a poverty level increase, डोमेस्टिक वायलेंस बड़ा इंक्रीज हो गया है हमने देखा है पूरी दुनिया में ये हो रहा है तो अब विद ऑल दीज चेंजेस दैट आर टेकिंग प्लेस विद ऑल द इंपैक्ट वी डोंट नो व्हेन इट इज गोइंग टू एंड वी डोंट नो हाउ इट विल पैन आउट बट आई थिंक व्हेन वी आर ट्राइंग लेट अस से टू प्रोजेक्ट व्हाट द वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर इज गोइंग टू बी इन पोस्ट कोविड एरा I think one thing we will have to acknowledge and accept that life is not going to be the same as we have been used to it till end of 2019. In terms of uh, uh, foreign travel, I remember I used to travel so very extensively. My last travel was till the end of uh, February. Uske baad, I have not gone out, although I had... Uh, so many programs, and I'm sure the same is true as far as uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor is concerned, you are concerned, and other participants. Foreign travel may bahut kami aayegi, big conferences, big seminars may bahut kami aayegi. Aap restaurants ka business hai, hotel ka business hai, itna zyada bada business hai, to ye in sab mein zaroor kami aayegi. Aur is mein do teen cheez hain faayde ki bhi hain, jo jab hum dekhte hain, as far as climate change was such a challenge. पहले और now we can see the blue skies आप देख सकते हैं and you hear the twitter of the birds around आप जहाँ पर भी हैं so I think as far as climate change is concerned as far as environment is concerned as far as the time that we are able to give to our families socially I think that has improved so I think there are a number of Positives and a number of negatives also as far as uh, uh, the impact of this uh, coronavirus is concerned. Uh, let me, you know, now when I come to the major theme of this, what is the post-COVID order going to be uh, to look like? What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a few trends as far as some of the major players in the world order are concerned. And then try to see where we are, how have the trends uh, been working, see where we are and extrapolate them a little to the future. Uh, Vice Chancellor Sahib ne kaha, jo agle 4-5 mahine mein kya hone wala hai, bilkul thik baat hai, kisi ko nahi malum hai. Kuch bahut apratyashit cheezen ho sakti hai. Parantu hum ko dekhna hoga on the basis of trends aur pichle 4 mahine mein kya hua hai, aage kya hota hai. So there are two or three, uh, four aspects that I will uh, touch uh, briefly upon. 
Uh, the first is in terms of the rise of China, because that is a major player in uh, global affairs. The second would be on uh, uh, the United States, particularly as far as uh, the US-China contestation is concerned, the US-China confrontation is concerned. And I'll speak briefly also on the domestic politics, the domestic situation in the United States, because that has an impact on whatever has happening in the world. Agar mere paas samay hua to mein thoda bahut multilateralism par kaise how that has come under uh, stress and strain, thoda bahut globalization par, because that, there has been a huge disillusionment as far as the globalization is concerned, not only as a result of the coronavirus, but it has got accentuated. It has got enhanced as a result of the coronavirus. Uske upar bolunga aur ant mein, मैं कुछ करीब 10 मिनट यकीनन रखना चाहता हूं जो मैं भारत के ऊपर बोलूं भारत का क्या इसमें स्थान है क्योंकि भारत कैसे इससे जूझ रहा है ये जो हमारे पास सिचुएशन आई है और अभी कोरोना के साथ-साथ हमारे पास जो बॉर्डर पर चीन के साथ हमारा कॉन्फ्रंटेशन हो रहा है गोइंग फॉरवर्ड हाउ डू वी रिएक्ट टू इट हाउ डू वी रिस्पोंड टू सो गुड सो लेट मी कम फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल एज़ फार एज़ चाइना इज कंसर्न मेरे विचार से सभी को मालूम है चाइना दो इट इज द सेकंड लार्जेस्ट इकोनॉमी इन द वर्ल्ड करीब 14 15 ट्रिलियन डॉलर्स उसकी जीडीपी है इट हैज बीन ग्रोइंग उसका शुरुआत हुई थी 1978 में जब उन्होंने अपना इकोनॉमी को ओपन कर दिया उस समय उनके जनरल सेक्रेटरी उनके लीडर हुआ करते थे डेंग जियाओपिंग उसके बाद आगे चलते हुए मैं कुछ लैंडमार्क्स बताऊंगा मैं कुछ बहुत ही जो अहम पड़ाव थे उनके इस डेवलपमेंट में वो बताऊंगा सो अगला पड़ाव जो था द अदर लैंडमार्क वाज 2001 व्हेन इट बिकेम अ मेंबर ऑफ द डब्ल्यूटीओ ऑफ द वर्ल्ड ट्रेड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन उसके बाद अगला पड़ाव था 2008 उसमें दो चीजें हुई एक तो चीन के यहां ओलंपिक्स हुए व्हेन इट रियली अनाउंस्ड इट्स कमिंग टू द uh you know uh, coming forward as far as the world is concerned or dusra wahan par 2008 mein international economic and financial crisis hua aur sabse aakhri padav tha wo jab xi jinping jo ab unke uh, rashtrapati hain 2012 mein wo general secretary bane aur 2013 mein wahan ke rashtrapati bane aur uske baad we can see that there is a much greater assertiveness and aggressiveness as far as china is concerned and i will speak a little bit about that china ki agar hum economy ko dekhte hain maine kaha abhi kareeb 14 trillion dollar hai to uski uh, from 1978 till about 2010 2012 it had 9% gdp growth 10% gdp growth 12% gdp growth double digit bhi hua aur uh, us hisab se agar hum dekhein to 1980 mein भारत की जीडीपी करीब करीब चीन की जीडीपी के समानांतर थी इट वाज मोर और लेस द सेम परंतु आज अगर देखें तो करीब चार गुना साढ़े चार गुना हमसे ज्यादा उनकी जीडीपी बढ़ गई है दैट इज द रीजन फॉर चाइनाज असर्टिवनेस एज फार एज इंडिया इज कंसर्न उसके बाद अगर हम देखें वी सी दैट इन 2013 इट बिकेम द वर्ल्ड लार्जेस्ट ट्रेडर इट ऑल्सो shot ahead of the united states as far as its gdp in purchasing par parity terms is concerned so china has been growing at a very rapid pace do teen aur cheeze unhone ki hai which is uh, uh, unhone uh, south china sea mein 2016 mein humne dekha jo kaise unhone apna wahan par या, सो so, 2016 में हमने देखा जो कैसे साउथ चाइना सी में उन्होंने अपना प्रभुत्व बढ़ाने का प्रयास किया जस्ट टू सेंटेंसेस ऑन दिस साउथ चाइना सी में चाइना सेज दैट इट ओन्स इट हैज इट शुड हैव कंट्रोल ओवर एन एरिया 80 परसेंट ऑफ दी साउथ चाइना सी साउथ चाइना सी इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एरिया Uh, मैं अभी इसके बारे में नहीं बोलूंगा अगर कुछ प्रश्न होते हैं तो उसका जवाब देते हुए मैं इसका बताऊंगा 
पर बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण क्षेत्र है करीब 3.9 मिलियन स्क्वायर किलोमीटर्स उसका एरिया है एंड चाइना डिमांड्स दैट इट कंट्रोल्स अबाउट 80 परसेंट ऑफ इट और उसने एक नाइन डैश लाइन लगाई हुई है बट चाइना वॉज चैलेंज इन टू एंड इट वॉज टेकन टू द परमानेंट कोर्ट ऑफ आर्बिट्रेशन इंटरनेशनल कोर्ट ऑफ जस्टिस के मुकाबले का इन कोपन हेगन वहां पर जो भी दलील थी चाइना की सब एकदम रद्द कर दी गई ऑल इट्स आर्ग्यूमेंट्स वर रिजेक्टेड आउट ऑफ हैंड बट स्टिल चाइना डिड नॉट एक्सेप्ट इट सो टू से इट जस्ट टोर दैट डिसीशन दैट जजमेंट और वाइस uh, साहब आप जानते हैं जो ये इंटरनेशनल लॉ का क्या अहमियत है क्या स्ट्रेंथ है और क्या वीकनेसेस भी हैं सो एनी वे चाइना वॉज एबल टू टेयर दैट एंड थ्रो इट अवे and continue to occupy whether it was the islands in that area uh, spratly islands paracel islands scarbor islands so much so that it st- started creating artificial islands and it started militarizing them to uske upar usne apna pura control jamane ka prayas kiya dusra usne kiya jo ek project apna start kiya 2013 mein jaise xi jinping aaye which was known as the belt and road initiative Belt and Road Initiative is ka basically it is a geo strategic project to expand and enhance its hegemony its strategic dominance over this area and over this world India ne uske virudh apni awaaz uthayi usme kaha jo isme debt trap aap la rahe hain deshon ko jaise humne dekha hai Sri Lanka mein Hammadota port mein unhone kiya hai हमने कहा ये देशों की सॉवरिटी और टेरिटोरियल इंटेग्रिटी को रिस्पेक्ट नहीं करता क्योंकि हमारा जो क्षेत्र है गिलगिट बल्तिस्तान थ्रू इट इट इज कंस्ट्रक्टिंग द चाइना पाकिस्तान इकोनॉमिक कॉरिडोर सो ये वाली सब चीजें हुई जो कि शी जिनपिंग के आते हुए ये वाले ट्रेंड्स थे पहले ऐसा भी था उनके कानून में अकॉर्डिंग टू देअर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन अ प्रेजिडेंट कुड बी इन पोजिशन ओनली फॉर टू टर्म्स in 2018 xi jinping got that removed so he has the possibility of being the president for life so there were all these changes that were taking place people in china it's a centrally controlled uh, system they were raising some objections but still uh, uh, he was uh, xi jinping was able to get over them now we come to the coronavirus so initially the manner in which it was handled the whole world said that it was uh, done in a uh, uh, non transparent way uh, china tried to deceive uh, the countries by putting a lid over it jinhone uske virudh bola dr levin liang unka muh band kar diya gaya unko bahut oppress kiya gaya unko yatna di gayi unse kaha gaya jo aap rumors mat phailaiye wagaira wagaira ultimately on the 23rd of january china ne bhi accept kiya that there is a new virus pneumonia like virus jiska hame pata nahi hai which moves from human being to human being so unke virudh ye bhi uh, wahan ke log bhi unhone prashn uthaye jo aap aisa kar rahe hain uh, corona virus ke bare mein but i think uh, going forward he has uh, been able to take care of this uh, domestic opposition to him he has been able to travel all around the country and tell them that china has been successful in dealing with the corona virus and he gives the example of developed countries like the united states like france like italy like spain like uk which have been utter failures as far as this is concerned so he has been able to uh, shore up his support in the domestic uh, 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 in his domestic constituency other challenge that uh, xi jinping faces today is of economy unki economy although it started uh, it was the first mover advantage sabse shuruaat mein uh, it uh, started in april while all the other countries are still trying to grapple with the corona virus parantu fir bhi wo uh, itna zyada aage nahi chal paaye hain kyunki jo export markets hain wo unke liye bahut aavashyak hai aur export markets kareeb 40% unka jo gdp hai wo export hota hai he is not been able to do it so china has tried to uh, move into leadership position as far as the world is concerned but there are huge domestic challenges there are huge external challenges 
because it has been trying to browbeat uh, the countries. Just to give you one example, that of Australia. Australia asked for, I'm sure uh, most of the participants here would be aware, Australia asked for an independent, international, uh, impartial investigation into the origins of the coronavirus. Because it said that we should know that we don't commit the same mistakes in future so that we are not uh, afflicted by the same coronavirus as we move forward. And chi uh, Australia, uh, China came down very heavily upon Australia. Uh, if uh, there is interest during question answer session, I can go into detail on that. But just one point on that, which is that uh, uh, Aust uh, Australia was threatened by China. In fact, Australia is hugely dependent upon China for its economy. About 27% of its exports go to China. And China said that we will uh, uh, impose punitive tariffs on imports from Australia, whether it is beef, whether it is barley, whether it is uh, wheat. Uh, we will not allow our students to go to travel to Australia to study there. We will not allow our tourists to go to Australia to, uh, uh, to spend money there. And that will have an impact on Australian economy and on the Australian should be able to change the Australian policy. It has not changed. So uh, China finds itself that it has lost a huge amount of uh, uh, international prestige. It has lost a huge amount of uh, its uh, good reputation. It had a good opportunity. It could have been generous. It could have been empathetic. But it started sending out its uh, uh, medical equipment, whether it was masks or it was PPEs or it was medicines. But it was so ag aggressive and abrasive that everyone, every country should uh, say how grateful they are to China. But many of these items were also defective. So it has lost uh, a huge opportunity as far as uh, this is concerned. And uh, this is evident from the discussions that took place at the World Health Assembly last year, which, uh, in which more than 130 countries uh, uh, got together to pass a resolution that there should be an independent investigation into the origin of coronavirus. So this is where uh, China finds itself, but uh, it also considers that uh, it is in a very strong position because all the other countries are dealing with the virus, their economies are affected, but China is going strong. President Xi is finding himself in a very strong position because he was able to get two important meetings. You know, the point I want to make here is that if she did not feel so confident, he could have postponed the National People's Congress, you know, their parliament meeting, which took place in the third week of May. But he feels confident as far as his domestic constituency is concerned. So this is uh, China as we see it now and as we see it going forward. It considers itself to be strong. It says that it can withstand all the criticism and the opposition of the world outside. Let's come to the United States. The uh, points that I would like to make as far as the United States is concerned is uh, it had a unipolar moment. It had a unipolar moment when the Soviet Union disintegrated in 1991. From 1991 till 2001, it was the only superpower in the world because there was no challenger, there was no equivalent. But then it, uh, you know, it is mentioned by uh, Richard Haas, who is uh, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations and a very thoughtful person as far as world affairs are concerned. He said that during the time of uh, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, America was an activist sheriff. Sheriff meaning a person, an individual or a country which tries to maintain law and order in the world. During the time of Obama, it became a reluctant sheriff. It was withdrawing. And during the time of Trump, it has become a retired sheriff. It doesn't want to engage. So this is, you know, in terms of its engagement in the multilateral issues is also concerned. So we have 1991, then we have 2001, when you had the 9-11 attacks on the 
uh, World Trade Center in New York and on Pentagon in Washington, D.C. So that is, uh, brings down America several notches. The age of unipolarity is over. Then we come to 2008 and we see that uh, uh, we have uh, the international economic crisis. And as a result of that, the United States, Europe, Japan, every one of them, their economies come down and the emerging markets increase, particularly China and India, they grow. So this is the sort of uh, uh, situation that uh, we find ourselves when Trump uh, takes over the presidency. He is uh, uh, against alliances. He's against multilateral institution, uh, institutions. He's an isolationist. He, for him, the mantra is America first. So he wants to focus only on American interests, little realizing that the leadership of the United States in the post Second World War era has been uh, created because of its alliances and its partnerships with other democracies and its like-minded countries. So he picks up fight with the G7, he picks up fight with the NATO, he picks up fight with individual countries, Japan, Korea, France, Germany, everyone. Of course, one saving grace is that he doesn't really pick up a fight with India. As far as India's relations with the United States are concerned, they continue to grow. And I will come to that. So uh, if we come up to, uh, he has uh, this uh, huge trade war with the China, the US-China trade war in uh, 2018. And we come to a good uh, uh, result for the Americans. We come to a good result in January of this year. So from uh, 15th January, he signs an agreement according to which China will be required to import $200 billion of additional goods, products, and services from the United States every year during the current year and next year. And he thought that the economy is doing well. As I told you last year, the US economy was moving at about two and a half, three percent So the economy is doing well. He was well placed to win the next election that takes place in 2020, November, 2nd of November. And then comes coronavirus. And he has been hit with such a whammy. It has been had such a huge full impact that he has not been able to recover. He's still reeling under the impact of the coronavirus. Uh, why? Basically, if we look at the American figures as to how much they are, I think it is about uh, five. Uh, uh, it is huge numbers, very large numbers. It is the highest numbers in terms of uh, 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 patients who have been, uh, who have tested positive. It's uh, more than, uh, uh, if the total number is uh, 10 uh, million, I think uh, America has about 2.5 million. And the number of deaths is about 110,000, which is huge. And the number of recoveries is about 40% uh, uh, of the people who have been affected. So he is being held out that he has not been able to deal in an efficient and an effective way with the coronavirus. So if you look at his uh, popularity ratings, they have been coming down over the last two, three months. So first is ineffectiveness in dealing with the coronavirus. Second, the economy is not doing well. As I told you, the IMF has said the economy will decline by 8.5%, which is huge. So there'll be unemployment, there'll be joblessness. And we find that, uh, that uh, Mr. Biden, who is his uh, opponent, as far as uh, Democrats are concerned, he is building a very substantial lead as far as uh, uh, Trump is concerned. So Trump is getting extremely nervous. As far as he's concerned, China and the World Health Organization, because he charges that World Health Organization has been uh, uh, too soft on China. It should have uh, uh, declared a pandemic much earlier. It should have declared that uh, there are, that the coronavirus can be transmitted from one human being to another. That would have given more time to the people to prepare themselves for it. But he was taken in 
the director general of WHO was taken in by whatever China was telling him. So he holds China and the WHO responsible. They are the, so to say, whipping boys as far as his own election is uh, concerned. Uh, it doesn't look good for him. He is becoming uh, quite frustrated. He's becoming very nervous. But let us see what happens. The economy doesn't show much signs of recovery, but that is what he's trying to do because if the economy recovers, then he will have a better possibility uh, as far as uh, the elections are concerned. Now, one word, even if Mr. Biden were to win in, two, uh, in November 2020, I don't think that there will be much of a change as far as the policies are concerned. The policies will not change. The style might be different because he might not be so unpredictable. He might try to reach out to the partners in uh, the uh, Europe, in Japan, and all the other places. He might uh, not be so aggressive as far as multilateral organizations are concerned. The Honorable Vice Chancellor would be aware of uh, how Trump moved out of the Paris Accord on climate change, how he has moved out of the uh, Iranian nuclear deal, joint a comprehensive program of action. He has moved out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Isha, you would be aware of uh, all the things that uh, uh, Trump has done against uh, the commitments on the multilateral and intergovernmental front. So that might change, style might change, substance in terms of opposition to China, that is not going to change because if there is one aspect, one issue on which there is un unity in the United States amongst the political class, business class, common people, academia, it is against China. The China is a systemic rival. China is a strategic threat. Now, last uh, uh, eight minutes or so, Isha, if it is all right, I would like to spend on uh, India. And uh, because I'm sure uh, the participants here would be keen to hear about uh, what, how we have been dealing with it and my, my take. This is my take, but I would uh, be happy to hear uh, comments and questions on that. So first, as far as COVID is concerned, I think we have uh, done uh, reasonably well. We started the lockdown when it uh, needed to be done. At that time, just before that, a large number of Indian and international uh, analysts and uh, uh, economists, those who sort of, you know, work on models, et cetera, they had said that by the end of May, we would have about 5 million uh, positive cases in India, and we would have about 1.5 lakh deaths in India. As against that, if you see, we have about uh, 5 lakh positive cases. We have about 15,000 deaths. Unfortunate, but still in terms of numbers, it is uh, quite uh, 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 not a very large number. And I think what is uh, hopeful, uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor had mentioned about hope as we go forward. I think as far as India is concerned, what is hopeful is that uh, our uh, rate of casualties is uh, low. Uh, our rate of recovery is uh, very high. It is about 56, 57%. That means out of the five, uh, uh, about uh, five lakh uh, people who have been affected, more than two and a half lakh have already recovered. And so we have our challenges uh, as far as uh, some of the states, whether it is Maharashtra, Mumbai, Delhi, uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Ahmedabad, etc. But I think we are trying to deal with it to the extent possible. Our uh, rate of uh, positive infections per million of people is the lowest in the world. Our rate of death per million people is the lowest in the world. So that is on the health issue, on the economy issue. I mentioned about it. Economy, we had 4.2% GDP growth last year. This year, IMF has predicted day before yesterday, minus 4.5%. Others have also mentioned three to 5%. But let us see what happens. I think there are a number of new initiatives that have been announced by the government. They have said about 10% uh, of our GDP 
that means uh, about uh, 20 billion dollars of uh, uh, of uh, uh, stimulus of inputs maybe they might not it might not be a direct stimulus into the economy it is not money going into the pockets of the people but still the banks have been told that the government will stand 100% guarantee for the loans that are given to msmes etc you know as it has been said never let a crisis go waste and i think the government has used this opportunity to introduce a large number of far reaching reforms whether it is in the area of agriculture whether it is in the area of labor of land reforms of corporate taxation etc we already see that uh, people who had gone away, the migrant labor who had gone away, they are coming back. I was just reading this morning, 100% uh, reservation on trains, which are coming back to uh, different uh, uh, centers of uh, economic production. And that is what we need to do. We have uh, the program that has been announced by the Prime Minister, Atul Nirbhar program. And I think that is also very important. Now, India's relations with China and with the United States, uh, I think that is important because wherever we go, uh, India's relations with these two countries are going to determine in a very significant way as to what our place in the world is going to be. But before that, I think we have also used the uh, crisis, the pandemic, to reach out to a large number of countries, to a large number of our partners and to strengthen our multilateral footprint, intergovernmental footprint. Why do I see that? Just two sentences on that. Even before the uh, virus, even before the pandemic had assumed its uh, very uh, huge proportions, on 15th of uh, March, the Prime Minister organized a web meeting, a webinar or summit meeting of the SAR countries where we decided how we will cooperate. On the 26th of March, he was able to encourage the then chair of G20, that is Saudi Arabia, <coughs> to have a uh, G20 summit meeting to discuss this issue. Also going forward over all these uh, uh, months, he has spoken, I think, individually to more than 50 heads of state and government, including Trump, including Putin, including uh, Macron in France, Angela Merkel, Boris Johnson, Shinzo Abe, Scott Morrison, you name it. He's. So he's reached out to all parts of the world, Middle East, West Asia, basically to strengthen India's relations on a bilateral level and also at the global level. India has emerged as the pharmacy of the world. And so we have been uh, supplying medicines either as grant or in commercial terms to more than 130 countries. So I think in that sense, on the health issue, we have acquitted ourselves rather creatively. As far as China is concerned, we have been trying to deal, manage our relations with China. It is basically a competitive relation. So we are managing our uh, competition as well as cooperation. But uh, right now we see what is happening uh, from the beginning of May and what happened unfortunately on the 15th of June. So there have been a number of questions asked as to why did uh, uh, China do this? What was it that India was doing that China wanted India to stop doing? And many reasons have been given. One is in in China's uh, perspective, India was moving too close to the United States. India had become a member of the Quad. India had uh, uh, opposed China on the BRI. India had uh, invited countries, which uh, companies which were in China and the global value chains to come to India. India had taken uh, the step against uh, Chinese investments. In my view, some or all of them might be true, but I don't think it really makes a difference. I think the rationale for China to do what it is doing is two or threefold. One is it feels that China has arrived today. It has become a powerful country. 
while all the other countries are dealing with the, the economic problems and the pandemic, it is one country which can flex its muscles and it can reach out and uh, acquire territory that it always has been uh, uh, wanting, that it has been demanding. And it feels confident that none of the countries will be able to do anything. That is why it has uh, gone out to South China Sea. It has uh, picked up quarrels with uh, Vietnam, with Philippines, with Indonesia, with Malaysia. It has sent its uh, uh, vessels against Japan, against Taiwan, and here also against India. It feels it can do this and no one is going to intervene. The second reason in my view is, I don't think we should really be looking at what China has got aggrieved about, because then it will put us on the back foot and we will say, okay, what do we need to do so that China does not get offended? Uh, what I think China's game plan also is, is that uh, we need to show India its position. As far as China is concerned, its view of the world order is a hierarchical order and which China is sitting at the top and all the other countries are vassal states or subservient to it. And it finds that India is the only country which is either a competitor or it is a potential threat. So it wants to send out a message to India that you are not our equal. And so the scars of 1962 that are still fresh on the mind of the Indian psyche, it wants to further exacerbate those scars today. It also wants to send out a message to the world and to India's neighborhood that India is not equal to China. It is not, uh, uh, you should, uh, you should uh, uh, focus on having better relations with China rather than with India. Uh, India has uh, many options. Military option is one. Uh, conversation, dialogue at diplomatic level, political level, that is another. Economic is another. Uh, political is another. Uh, during the uh, conversation during the question answer session, we can come on to that because I know that uh, I'm, uh, uh, I just want to take last few minutes on our relations with the United States. And what I would like to say as far as relations with the United States is concerned is uh, that uh, we have had uh, today, uh, we have the best relations uh, between India and the United States. Uh, Prime Minister Modi, when he visited uh, US and he was addressing the joint session of the US Congress in 2016, he said that we are indispensable partners. That means both of them have to be with each other. I think what has changed today, although both are democracies, we've had similarity and congruence of values between the two countries. What has changed today is that today there is also a convergence of interest between the countries. Convergence because uh, China is trying to dislodge the United States from its position of preeminence and supremacy. And China is also trying to constrain India in South Asia. So we need to cooperate, we need to collaborate with the United States whether it is for our defense needs, defense requirements, or it is for our capital needs, or it is for our technology needs, we need to cooperate and collaborate. The statement made by Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State day before yesterday, that uh, they are going to be more proactive in Asia, they are going to be moving their, uh, uh, their uh, uh, forces from Germany to Asia, I think that is a very strong message. The presence of three huge aircraft carriers, Ronald Reagan, Nimitz, and Roosevelt in the South China Sea is also a message to China that it will not go unchallenged. So I think that is a very important message. Also the message uh, that uh, President Trump gave, he said uh, that uh, uh, America is wanting to expand G7 and would like to include India. India has welcomed this uh, proposal from President Trump. So I think we need to work together. We need to expand our alliances as we have been doing. 
whether it is with Japan, with the US, I already mentioned, Australia, even with Russia, have strong relations with that, with Europe. Last words. So this is the lay of the land as we see it. Uh, the United States, which has been the leader of the world, has shown itself unfit to lead in this time of crisis. They have been reverting. They have been going back into their own shell. shell. As far as China is concerned, it wants to lead the world. It thinks it is ready. It thinks it is able. The world doesn't think so. It has burnt its bridges. So it is, uh, I think this opportunity will come to China maybe after a long time. Uh, there is, I feel that a compact of middle powers that can come together and that can sort of, you know, try to ensure uh, stability, security, prosperity, right the rules of the game in terms of how the world order is going to be conducted as we move forward. Uh, as the Honorable Vice Chancellor said, these are early days. We are trying to make, uh, we are trying to speculate, we are trying to make some prognostications about the future based on the trends so far and the situation as it prevails today. So with these few words, uh, let me uh, finish, say that India has conducted itself uh, well, creditably, but the real uh, uh, challenge is going forward, both on the health front, on the economy front, and on security front as far as China is concerned. But we have a strong leadership, so I'm hopeful that we will come out of it uh, unscathed uh, as far as all these issues are concerned. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And I'll be delighted to listen to the comments and uh, respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Isha. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing such insightful information with us. And now moving towards the question answer round. Uh, if any participant have any question, you may drop the question in the chat box. We have already received a few questions in the chat box. And uh, sir, uh, shall we allow the participants to directly ask you the question or would you like to read the questions from the chat box and answer? Isha, I'm in your hands, but I think <laughs> it would be good if we can get uh, the participants to read out or uh, to sort of, you know, pose their questions because in I the think chat box. Be a, uh, the, it'll be a direct uh, sort of, you know, connect uh, and uh, okay. I would like to hear from them. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So participants, you can raise your hand. Yes. Arpit, please. And if uh, you could kindly introduce yourself, I would appreciate that very much. Yes, sir. My question. Yes, please go ahead. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, sir, first of all, I, I request you. all the participants to kindly keep yourself mute. We will allow the participants one by one to ask the questions. So all the participants, please keep yourself in mute mode. Only one participant who is asking the question will keep uh, will unmute himself. Now go ahead with your question, sir. Uh, sir, uh, very, very uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, congratulations to Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Chahanji and uh, moderator Dr. Isha Badwa. It's Dr. J.K. Blatty from JNDU, Jalandhar, Punjab. Uh, thanks a lot to the keynote speaker, Sajin Harji, for giving us a very, very wide, speculated, you know, wide and covered uh, uh, power scenario of India as far as foreign affairs are concerned. You know, you have given an apt insight into relationship of India with China, India with US, and India on its own self. I was just typing my query on my chat box and in between I had this kind of a message from you that let the participant raise a question and become uh, visual on the video face. Thanks a lot, sir. So I would like to uh, seek a solution from you since you have a great smell of foreign affairs and you are given a very apt, uh, you know, economic aspect and you have in a very brief traced out the historical uh, from 90s till this date. Uh, what kind of a solution you uh, suggest for our country to come out of this kind of a mess, I would call it. Uh, I have got two points here, sir. First, we are a landlocked. Uh, we are having our immediate neighborhood, which is with, with whom, unfortunately, we are not at ease. 
historically we were having good relation with nepal now nepal is creating problem maybe at behest of china uh, we are already in with source relationship with our pakistan then we are being you know uh, threatened by china once and again time and again on boundary issues then un security council this and that i would like to learn from you what kind of a recipe you suggest as a person with foreign affairs that what kind of economic decision making we should do as india while going ahead with our surge for opening ourselves in the present crisis when entire world is giving us a message that now it's a opportunity for us to cash on and enter on a global economic scenario and jump back on the fdi scene no doubt mr modi has succeeded in uh, you know maintaining a good rapport with the foreign players like you have uh, really quoted the 50 nations to which he has maintained his communication open i would like to know from you sir what is the solution for india to go strategically because time is now ripe for us to think out of box maintain good relations with china of course not at the cost of going down to such a low position because china is already tested to be a very bad phenomena all over the world good uh, thank you very much uh, for this question i think uh, this is a very broad question and i you know one could go on for a long time but depend because of the paucity of time what i i would really like to say is i think the first important focus that we need to undertake is on our economy we need to enhance our economy you see what china keeps telling us every time that there is an interaction with china is that it has a uh, its economy is five times as large as india but uh, and that is why what it wants is that india should uh, occupy a subservient position you know it should occupy a second grade position as far as china is concerned it should uh, it should accept the suzerainty of china india is not interested in that india is not interested in occupying a number two position india wants an a relationship of equals and that is what it has been doing so far what we have been doing is that uh, in 1988 you would recall that when uh, prime minister rajiv gandhi visited china then it was thought opportune that we put the boundary question on the back burner and we try to develop our relations on all other fronts yes. we have tried to do that and we have come this far Uh, we have tried we have been telling uh, china that we need to settle our border but they are not interested because they want to keep it open as a pressure point against china, against india so that india can be boxed in south so asia itself china has problems with many other countries in the uh, maritime area whether japan taiwan all the asean countries uh, etc uh, republic of korea so it has these problems and it keeps these open so that it can pressurize those countries so i think first what we need to do is we need to enhance our economy and as i said that right now a large number of decisions have been taken you know what are the challenges as far as india's economy is concerned it was the labor laws it was the land laws it was the corporate taxation it is the ease of doing business we don't have any global value chains we had problems in our agriculture we had problems in our infrastructure so i think right now what is happening is that we are trying to deal with all that the second aspect you know to be a very a brief on this we need to enhance our uh, external engagement we need to bring in the external balancing as far as china is concerned and i would say that we have been Uh, extremely successful as far as this aspect is concerned we have our relations whether it is uh, with uh, united states with japan with australia with all the others they have uh, shown a very significant improvement as far as last 6 uh, 7 years are concerned on uh, neighborhood what you said uh, is uh, uh, important uh, pakistan has always been an adversary china has also i think we have always known it uh, that uh, uh, it has been an adversary but we have always tried to manage our relations because uh, we have such a huge boundary 
3,488 kilometers. It is not a settled boundary. It's a disputed boundary. So we have to manage relations. We cannot be overly provocative. And we have not been that. But now that we have been presented with this issue on our borders, we have to stand steadfast on our borders militarily also. The third aspect is, I think, internally, we need to ensure that there is unity internally. Unfortunately, uh, this, uh, what you hear on the television screens, television channels, newspapers, I think this uh, cacophony of sounds uh, sends out a very wrong message, a very demoralizing message to our own people, to our armed forces, and also to our adversaries outside the country, because they will use the arguments that your opponents in the country are making to, uh, uh, to, to criticize you. So I think that is a huge uh, demoralizer. Uh, we need to work simultaneously on different fronts, need to take it uh, forward on uh, at the level of economy, at the level of military preparedness, at the level of uh, foreign policy, external relations, at the level of uh, domestic uh, policy also. Right. And I think time is ripe. The government has been taking measures in this, but we need to take it forward uh, uh, as we go along even more energetically. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Gulati, sir, for asking your question. And I hope you are satisfied with the answer as well. Moving on to the next participants, uh, Professor Dr. Kamani, please feel free to ask your question. You can unmute yourself. Professor Dr. Kamani, please unmute yourself to ask your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you are hearing me. Yes, sir, you are audible. Please go ahead with your question. Uh, sir, my yes. very rude question is, how to start the internal social unity uh, along with the social media or anyone? First, our immediate step is to bring the social unity for making India process. That is the first rude thing we have to do. Then. We have to think about the external economy or export and all other things. Sir. First, the step is in our country is to build the confidence on people as well as the working uh, sectors, all type of working sectors. Today, we are facing main problem in service sector, that how to manage that service sector. Here is the no time to complain one to another, as you uh, said. Sir? Uh, sir, I have a humble request. Kindly keep the question short. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Only my very good question <laughs> is how to how to manage the social unity to build up the internal economy. Then external economy, export, and all other things comes. We are having the better position for external and export economy. No problem. First, we have to start by our internal economy. How to build up this, sir? Please, sir. No, absolutely. I think you're very right. You know what the Prime Minister has also mentioned, and I think he has put a vision in front of the people that we need to develop and evolve ourselves. Uh, Dr. Kamani, uh, please mute yourself. Okay. Oh, please. Yeah, so what I was saying is that the Prime Minister has given us a target, a vision of uh, developing into a $5 trillion economy over the next five years. It might be five years, it might be six years, it might be seven years. Today, we are a $3 trillion economy. And I think he has also given us a mantra of being Atmanirbhar. So we have to focus uh, on uh, the local products, on the local uh, uh, manufacturers. You have, uh, Professor Kamani mentioned about uh, services. Now, services do account for about 56% of our GDP. But in terms of providing employment and jobs, they are not as, uh, 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 they don't provide so many jobs to our people. And today, when we have 1.3 billion people 
65% of them are below the age of 35 years. We have to provide jobs to them. Today, we know that as far as agriculture is concerned, about 60% of my people are in villages, but they account for only 16 or 17% of the GDP. So I think we need to enhance the productivity. We need to improve infrastructure there. We need to introduce reforms in agriculture. We also need to focus on manufacturing. Manufacturing also, because that is the one sector that can provide jobs to the people. And here we see also that about 17% of uh, our GDP is accounted for by manufacturing. We need to enhance that to uh, about 25%. And I think the, the, uh, the leadership, the government, and the prime minister are focused on that as to how to increase the, uh, the uh, element of manufacturing as far as the economy is concerned. You know, some of the initiatives that I mentioned uh, on the essential services uh, uh, provisions on MSMEs, uh, agriculture, I think these uh, decisions that have been taken, that in my view will go a long way in uh, enhancing our economy. As far as our engagement with the external sector is concerned in the area of economy, uh, we in the 3 trillion GDP, we find our exports are only to the tune of about 340 billion. And they actually from 2014 till now, they have been stagnating or they have been declining. Today, we are at the same level as we were in 2014. So I think we really need to give a strong impetus to uh, our exports. You would see that it is possible. Uh, there has been this huge over-dependence on China, not only as far as India is concerned, but as far as other countries is, are concerned. You would recall that when this whole coronavirus issue was going on, it was found that in the United States, which is a developed economy, 97% of its antibiotics were coming from China. So there is this recognition in the world over that this over-dependence on China needs to be brought down. And that is why many of the global value chains want to shift out of China. Of course, this was a trend even earlier because uh, the uh, Chinese economy was uh, slowing, because uh, Chinese wages were rising, because there was uh, anxiety as far as the US-China trade war was concerned. So many of them were coming out of China. And India has positioned itself to attract many of these companies to come to India. But I think we will have to uh, change our uh, laws, our policies, make ourselves more attractive in the area of taxation, in the area of, uh, of uh, infrastructure. Uh, just one example I would like to give, uh, because I don't want to uh, spend uh, more time on this issue. It's a very important issue. It's a very significant issue. You would recall that uh, when the pandemic started, India's expertise and possibility in manufacturing masks was close to nil. We were manufacturing minuscule proportions. Very quickly, we were able to put in position uh, manufacturing systems so that we could produce more than two lakh masks per day. We could produce from a level of zero to more than two lakh personal protective equipments per day. In the past also, you know, we depend for about 70% of our APIs, the active pharmaceutical ingredients for our uh, medicines on China. It is not rocket science. It is not as if we cannot make them. We used to make them earlier also, but when we started getting them cheaper by just a little amount from China, all our factories here closed down. So I think we need to start working on that again. There are many possibilities that we can. 
I think we need to reduce our dependence on China. And the first, uh, what I have been also recommending to the government very strongly is we need to send out a clear, strong message that we will not be entertaining the offer from Huawei for the 5G services in India. Because in addition to the fact that it will enhance our dependence on China, it is also going to be in terms of security, a huge risk as far as we are concerned. So I think there are a huge number of options and alternatives that are available. And the government in its wisdom needs to choose some of them or all of them and take them forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, moving on next, Dr. Ashish Srivastava, sir. Kindly unmute yourself to ask the question. Ashish Srivastava, sir. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Pranam, sir. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Pranam, sir. Pranam, Pranam. Uh, sir, ek mera hi question tha. Uh, main Honorable Prime Minister ne jo Aatmanirbhar Bharat ke liye 20 lakh crore diye sab kiya. लेकिन सर अपन ने अर्थशास्त्र में ये पढ़ा हुआ है कि ये डिमांड और सप्लाई पर निर्भर करता है तो इनने सप्लाई साइड ध्यान दिया लेकिन डिमांड साइड ध्यान नहीं दिया जैसा अपन ने किसी रोजगार सिद्धांत में पढ़ा था कि वो अल्पकाल में स्थिर रहती है कुल पूर्ति के लिए तो यहां पर मैं ये कहना चाह रहा था कि क्या अपन को परचेजिंग पावर पे ध्यान नहीं देना था क्या कुछ इस तरीके से क्योंकि मैं मार्केट में भी सर्वे करता हूं लोग बताते हैं कि माल तो है लेकिन कोई आ नहीं रहा ग्राहक आ नहीं रहा तो इस संबंध में मैं आपसे उजागर करना चाहूंगा कि ऐसा क्यों नहीं किया गया जी आपने जो प्रश्न किया है बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण प्रश्न है और आप जानते हैं जो इसके ऊपर बहुत सारी डिबेट्स होती भी रही हैं तो दो तीन चीजें मैं जो कहना चाहूंगा जो आपने बिल्कुल ठीक कहा जो यहाँ पर अभी जो प्रॉब्लम जो हमें दिक्कत आ रही है वो डिमांड की तरफ है और हमने उसको किया है सप्लाई की तरफ ज्यादा वो किया है पर मेरे विचार से देखिए अगर महात्मा गांधी नरेगा स्कीम है वहां पर क्योंकि मेरे विचार से एक और चीज है जो मैं समझता हूं गवर्नमेंट में गवर्नमेंट इज नॉट इंटरेस्टेड इन गिविंग आउट डोल्स जो भाई आप बिना काम किए आपको कुछ पैसा मिल जाए तो वो समझते हैं जैसे पहले था वो फार्म लोन्स का वो वेवर आप नहीं देना चाहते हैं आप कुछ ना कुछ उसके बारे में जी तो आप काम करके कुछ उसमें तो इसीलिए महात्मा गांधी नरेगा स्कीम में है वहां पर कितना ज्यादा मेरे ख्याल से चालीस हजार करोड़ से ज्यादा और इसमें बजट इसका प्रावधान किया गया है फिर जो है जो बैंक्स को ये कहा गया है देखिए बात ऐसी है एवरी वन एज बीन से हमारे पास लिक्विडिटी तो बहुत है हमारे बैंकों के पास पैसा तो बहुत है परंतु वो पैसा देने से हिचकिचाते हैं क्योंकि उनको अच्छे वो नहीं मिल रहे हैं दे आर नॉट एबल टू गेट रिलायबल क्रेडिबल लोग जिनको कि आप लोन दे सकें परंतु गवर्नमेंट कह रही है जो अब हम आपको 100 परसेंट गारंटी करते हैं तो आपको कोई इतना आपको ड्यू डिलीजेंस करके आपको इसमें कोई दिक्कत नहीं होनी चाहिए इनको आप वो लोन देने में तो इसीलिए मेरे विचार से ऐसी बहुत सारी दूसरी चीज है देखिए सरकार के पास रेवेन्यू कम हो गया है बिकॉज ऑफ द लॉकडाउन वगैरह वगैरह जीएसटी आपका आ नहीं रहा है सेल्स टैक्स वगैरह वगैरह और जिस प्रकार का रेवेन्यू होता है वो कम हो गया है तो मेरे विचार से जो निर्मला सीतारमन जी ने जो फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर ने आई थिंक शी इज कीपिंग हर पाउडर ड्राई सो टू से जो आगे चलते हुए देखिए अभी भी मान्य वाइस चांसलर साहब ने कहा था अभी शुरुआत हुई है अभी आगे क्या होना है हमें मालूम नहीं है हम जैसे ये जैसे, जैसे इसका कुप्रभाव बढ़ रहा है हम देख रहे हैं आगे चलते हुए क्या क्या होने वाला है सो लेट एस नॉट यूज जो मेरे पास एसेट्स हैं जो मेरे पास रिसोर्सेज है मैं एकदम अगर उसको मार्केट में हम उतार देते हैं तो फिर आगे चलते हुए हमारे पास कोई ऐसी संभावना नहीं रह जाएगी सो लेट अस गिव समथिंग और इसमें भी अगर क्योंकि आप देखते हैं जो फैक्ट्रीज बंद रही हैं इतने समय हालांकि ठीक है इन्वेंट्रीज रही होंगी इनके पास बिजनेसेस के पास परंतु एक सोच ये भी थी जो अगर हम पैसा दे देते हैं इफ वी गिव डायरेक्ट कैश 
support to the people and the uh, supply side is wanting in the market aapko wo saman nahi milta hai then the only impact it will have is it will raise uh, it will give a rise to inflation further inflation to isliye wo isko tandem mein karna chahte hain jo aap yahan par production bhi aapka badhe aur fir aapke paas paisa bhi aaye to all these other schemes ji dhanyawad ji thank you so much sir thank you uh, very much sir thank you thank you okay uh, thank you, uh, kindly uh, mute yourself sir now ji sir ji han ji next rachit gupta please go ahead with your question first introduce yourself and then go ahead with your question rachit gupta uh, uh, good afternoon uh, honorable guest speaker honorable vice chancellor sir Uh, actually isha ma'am rachit is on the live stream and he is not in the chat right now so okay. he asked me to ask a question on his behalf sure selishwar you go ahead with his question sir so rachit's question is do you think that shifting of industries from china to countries like mexico vietnam japan which are deemed to be influenced by the us can fire to uh, thucydides traps we are observing thoda sa thoda sa halka bolenge uh, uh, please Go little yes, soft, Salishwa. Yes, Go little soft. Yes, sir. Sir, Haan, do but... you think uh, hmm. that shifting of industries from China to countries like Mexico, Vietnam, which are deemed to be influenced by the US, can uh, give fire to suicide traps? We are observing. This is the question from Rachit Gupta. And sir, there's another question from my side. Sir, like uh, we have seen, the diplomatic relationship between the countries are basically founded upon the uh, Uh, exchange of defense and economic ties so do you not think the covid uh, the covid 19 is a warning for all countries to shift their based uh, foundation uh, base of the foundation of these diplomatic ties to education and health research ji uh, okay, very good yeah very good questions uh. so first if i may uh, you know respond to what uh, the first uh, uh, question was you know as far as thucydides trap is concerned uh, that is you know the uh, the theory that has been brought out by you know once again been uh, rejuvenated by george allison is uh, that if there is a rising power then there is very likely that there is going to be uh, the existing hegemon and the challenging hegemon so usme to wo ab hum dekh rahe hain jo aage chalte hue as we go forward that this is uh, uh, there is a possibility of uh, this being realized because the confrontation is increasing and i think what covid 19 has done is that these fault lines have become even sharper and there are many more fault lines that have emerged so this contestation for global hegemony and uh, supremacy and dominance is going to further sharpen as we go forward to wo aapka jo kehna hai jo thucydides trap ke bare mein parantu jahan tak aapne you know the question that you raised about uh, the uh, global supply chains and value chains moving out of china into uh, uh, vietnam into mexico etc dekhi even when the us china trade war was going on then also a large number of companies did move out because the uncertainty they did not want to face the uncertainty most of them moved to vietnam they moved to bangladesh they moved to mexico some moved to indonesia to india unfortunately there were only three uh, companies that came to india so india has to do its homework very well although that having been said i must say that there is a new report that uh, came out in april by ubs in which it said that india is the number one priority is the number one country which all these multinational and global companies are looking at for changing the uh, their uh, base as far as the global supply chains are concerned uh, i think that is uh, something encouraging but we also need to do our own bit as i mentioned uh, right at the beginning or what they are saying is that you know at times when you have put in so much of investment within the country it is very difficult to move it out 
what these companies are saying is that we will follow the one plus one philosophy. That means we will have one base in uh, China, but we will have an additional base of manufacturing in some other country so that our over dependence on China is not so huge and not so extreme. Because in the present case, what China had threatened, what Chinese companies had threatened, that they will stop supplying masks and ventilators to America if it continued to <coughs> identify the coronavirus as the Chinese virus or as the Wuhan virus. So they said that, uh, and this brings me to your next question, <clears throat> in terms of the importance of uh, education and health science. You see, earlier, health and medicine was taken as a soft subject, as a soft issue in terms of cooperation, collaboration, relations between different countries. It was not taken as to be, you know, at the same level as cyber security. Health security was important. Education security, important but not as important, <coughs> sorry, not as important as health security, uh, as uh, military security, as the security on the borders, as cyber security, as nuclear security, it was not that. But COVID-19 has done something that it has uh, catapulted the health security, pharmacies, all the other medicines, equipment from this area of uh, uh, soft issues, soft uh, relations to a very strategic uh, aspect of uh, uh, hard security issues. So going forward, pandemic, health, education, I think these are going to be also extremely important as we go, uh, as we look at our cooperation and collaboration between different countries. Yes. Thank you so much, sir, for answering these questions. I want to bring in your kind notice, sir, that Rachit Gupta and Saleshwar Yadav, they both are very bright students of BA LLB honors fourth semester, Dharm Shastra National Law University. So they are our students. Okay. 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 Uh, I think we have taken a lot of time, sir. Uh, would you like to take another one question or shall we now end this webinar? No, I'm happy to take one question. And uh, uh, okay. uh, particularly if uh, I would be particularly keen to listen to a comment from the Honorable Vice Chancellor or uh, uh, and or from you, Isha, yourself. Uh, I so, think, sir, uh, Chauhan, sir, is the right person <laughs> to comment. I am not the one, sir. I request Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to kindly speak. Sir, kindly unmute yourself. Yeah, 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 please. Uh, yeah. Isha, I will request that uh, if any student of, of our university want to ask any question, then okay. it can be taken as the last question. Otherwise, I will, uh, uh, what comment? I will just uh, express my appreciation and uh, uh, you see gratitude uh, for this wonderful interaction. But if there is any student who want to. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think Aditya Puri <laughs> would yes, surely yes. like to ask something, I'm damn sure. <laughs> you can invite him. Aditya Puri, please go ahead. I'm sure you have something to ask. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, uh, it was uh, such a delight to uh, have an interaction with you and uh, with the professor, sir, Isha, ma'am. Uh, sir, the question is, why is it so that the companies that are coming out from uh, China are not coming to India, but are going to other countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh? Uh, why is it so, sir? Look, the reason is that all these... Uh countries are more attractive as investment destinations. That is why they want to go there. They want to establish there. You see, we still are uh, uh, laden with the uh, red tapism, bureaucratic rules, uh, taking so much of time in terms of uh, uh, taking decisions. You know, we have covered a long way. If you look at, uh, if that is one indication, ease of doing business, I remember in 2014, when this government had come, 
then we were at 142 ranking as far as ease of doing business is concerned. Now, over the last five years or so, we have moved to the rank of 63. So we made quite a progress, about 80 ranks or so we have moved. But still, it is not good enough. And there are some particular issues, like, you know, in terms of, and that uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor and Isha, you and all your colleagues will be able to say, the aspect of uh, being able to fulfill the contracts, that is one area where we are extremely low. And that is where we, uh, our ranking comes down very heavily. So I think that is the area where we need to focus on because you have seen that there have been so many cases, retrospective application of taxation on Vodafone, uh, the problems with Enron and so on and so forth. So in terms of meeting contractual obligations, that is something that uh, India has not been uh, able to uh, acquit itself very creatively. But coming to the broader issue, we have to uh, make uh, our infrastructure better. Our, uh, uh, we are doing that in terms of uh, building roads, ports, uh, uh, getting uh, better facilities, uh, ease of doing business in terms of uh, uh, labor laws. You are aware of uh, this uh, South Korean company steel making uh, firm, POSCO. They came, they wanted to invest about $14 billion in Odisha. They were not able to get uh, approval for land after they stayed there for, I think, more than eight or 10 years. So they went away from there. So I think we need to uh, have a very close and a serious look at uh, what are the changes we need to do. Uh, as I said, now this crisis has been used as an opportunity by the government and a large number of uh, uh, decisions have been taken so that we can make ourselves more attractive. The Honorable Prime Minister himself has said that we are uh, uh, very keen to attract all these companies who want to move out of China. So I'm hopeful that something uh, significant will be done as we go forward. But all of us uh, need to uh, take this up as a challenge and uh, get these companies because I think it is going to be extremely beneficial. It's going to be, as we go uh, forward, it'll create uh, more jobs and uh, it will help us to enhance our GDP. What we are talking about from $3 trillion currently to $5 trillion in five or six years. I think this is the way to go forward and uh, hopefully in the coming months and years, we'll be able to realize and achieve this objective. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much sir, for answering this question. And uh, now I would like to request Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to speak a few words and conclude the session. <laughs> and sir, yes, I sir. just want to bring in your kind notice that we scheduled this meeting for two hours. So we are hardly left with last 12, 13 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Isha. Uh, we have utilized the time. And uh, uh, today we are having such a wonderful speaker who mesmerized us. And hopefully in future, we will do so. Uh, but uh, sir, uh, as far as our relations are concerned with foreign countries, we started with Panchshil. And then in between, so many hiccups were there. Though we believe in Vasudev Kutambukam. But uh, every time uh, we didn't get the fair treatment uh, where we expected. And again now, it is such a tight situation. On one hand, COVID-19 is there. On other hand, border problems are there. And not only from one side, even Nepal is raising its voice. And uh, slowly and slowly, I think uh, our uh, defense minister was in Russia for some time. And uh, USA, Trump, I don't know. Uh, much about the international relations, but uh, you have been a diplomat, even you understand the diplomacy. Uh, I don't know who can trust him uh, and how he will uh, move forward. So under this situation, I can only say that our leadership is very strong. But uh, nation couldn't be that strong in 70 years. What it 
should be. Uh, so I don't know. I can only say I'm looking only towards youth generation, young generation, my students, other students, technology, medical, because all problems, we will get the answers when our students, future generation uh, will take these challenges seriously. And they will be able to, because sir, uh, as you said, and I believe, uh, there can't be any ready-made solution to this problem. So I will say thank you very much for enlightening us. And uh, I, will I will request you to say a few words for my students, because students of law, my, uh, my international law teacher is not here, uh, Ms. Swati. And had she been here, uh, it had been more. And, uh, my head of department, at um, present uh, acting head of the department, uh, Dr. Shilpa, uh, she is traveling uh, from Patiala to Jabalpur uh, because from Monday onwards we are going to start our session. And uh, so um, uh, your uh, words of uh, guidance or you can say uh, blessings to my students. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, for these uh, comments. You know, the remarks that you made are very insightful and very perceptive. And uh, if I were to respond to them in a fuller measure, it would really need a much longer time than Isha is prepared to give us today. So, you know, what I will say very briefly, you are very right. As far as uh, Russia is concerned, our uh, Raksha Mantri was there for participation in the victory parade. So Russia continues to be, although we have, uh, uh, well, not exactly directly problems uh, with the Russia, but there are some wrinkles in our bilateral relationship. They are, uh, relationship is not what it used to be during the Soviet time. It is not what it used to be in 1971 we signed, when we signed the Treaty of Peace, Friendship and Cooperation. It is not even the same as it was in 2010 because today Russia has moved very significantly towards China. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of what uh, the West has done to uh, Russia as far as the Ukraine issue is concerned and the Crimean issue is concerned. So we can not depend so very much on Russia as we could have earlier. Russia has also moved towards Pakistan, not so much because of anything that we might have done, but because it wishes to engage with Pakistan because it wants to have a linkage to the Taliban. Because Taliban, it wants to have a, a relationship so that Taliban would be able to deal with the Islamic State which comes to Afghanistan. I don't want to get into the details of the, uh, you know, the, the geopolitics and the geostrategic aspects of our relations. I also fully concur with you, sir, when you say that uh, Mr. Trump is not to be trusted. He is mercurial, he is unpredictable. But then that is uh, the choice of the American people. You know, we cannot do anything about it. And uh, we have to make the best of what we have. So you would find that during Trump's tenure from the beginning of 2017 till now, relations of United States have worsened with all countries, including his alliance partners, Australia, Japan, Korea, France, uh, Germany, except with India. So I think this is a mark of the uh, the skillful uh, conduct of uh, foreign policy and uh, diplomacy that our leadership has been able to do. I agree with you as far as Nepal is concerned, but Nepal, I think uh, you mentioned that it was done at the behest of China. Yes, partly true, but also partly true that it was because of the internal political pressures that Mr. K.P. Sharma Oli was facing that he said that this would be a hyper-nationalistic card, an anti-Indian card, which is always, I have been to serve some of these uh, neighboring countries, I have served there, 
and i have seen that anti indianism serves fuels the nationalistic uh, uh, passion and fervor so he tried to put himself to continue his own position otherwise his own prime ministerial seat was in threat was in danger as you would see in the coming few days that might happen he might be removed from his position but he has done lasting damage to relations with india but going forward you know uh, a message to your students sir uh, what i would say that uh, the world today is changing at a very rapid pace and we need to be very nimble footed to deal with all the changes that are coming and we need to be i think uh, the sort of institution that you are uh, uh, leading that you are uh, uh, giving uh, uh, visionary guidance to uh, i think they all the students need to be uh, uh, very uh, con conscious and conscientious about the challenges as well as the opportunities that having been said i think what will stand them in very good stead i will say it is an oft repeated cliche hard work and focus there is no substitute to hard work there is no substitute to focus and dedication my own experience i have traveled all around the world in developed countries i have seen chinese students i have seen indian students chinese students you know in terms of the nationalism and the patriotism that they are imbued with and their commitment and determination and dedication to work hard to do their country proud is something to be admired you know we might have lots of problems with china but if we want to deal with china we also have to see where the strength lies and the strength lies in hard work determination dedication uh a very strong uh, uh, support for national identity so i would like to just leave these uh, thoughts uh, with you. your students that thank you very much <laughs> you know this has i have found that hard work has been a good mantra for me as i have traveled through the uh, through my life and uh, times have changed but uh, i don't think the significance of hard work has come down in fact it has even uh, Uh, improved it has gone better in the intervening period and thank you very much uh, uh, professor honorable vice chancellor you have uh, spent so much of time here i know you have a must have a very busy schedule it's a pleasure, pleasure for me pleasure for me but it's thank been you. such a such a wonderful uh, <laughs> thing uh, it's been very reassuring to have you here and isha i don't have uh, words to thank you you have been such an excellent uh, host of this uh, webinar and you have organized it uh, so beautifully so my felicitations and congratulations and uh, wishing you all the very best good health happiness success to you and to your students and to all your colleagues thank you very much thank you thank you so much sir your words of appreciation really means a lot to me finally coming to the end of today's session i want to express a vote of thanks on behalf of dharm shastra national law university jabalpur i extend our heartfelt gratitude to you sir for making time from your busy schedule to speak at the webinar and for providing insightful information to all the attendees i am sure our participants have benefited a lot by attending today's session and listening to your words of wisdom once again thank you so much for your valuable input and time i'm also thankful to our honorable vice chancellor sir professor balraj chauhan sir for giving us his valuable time headlines presented by i am also thankful to my active student coordinators arpit sanjar seleshwar yadav shubham saxena aditya puri ram tiwari ayush singhal for being a wonderful team to work with it would be a great failure at my end if i forget to thank you all yes i mean to say you all dear participants i express my heartfelt gratitude to all the academicians and students from different colleges and universities thank you for giving us your valuable time without your active participation this webinar would not have been possible 
before we end the session i request everyone to kindly rise for a national anthem and i request arpit sanjay to kindly share the video hello hello arpit we can't hear the audio arpit sanjay kindly restart the video and turn the audio on Ma'am, I think it's taking time. Sh shall we start singing by ourselves? Yes, yeah. please, Aditya. Jana gana mana di na. Jai Bharat Bhagya. म्यूट ऑल thank you so much everyone and uh, thank you so much for joining now we can finally close today's session thank you very much sir looking forward to meet you again